Today's reading comes from 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be, a, is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become dis- conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with the outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested and then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Thanks, Amy. We, the church, have accepted that it is the role of the clergy to preach, pray, provide care, serve, teach, evangelize, minister, and disciple to go out to the corners of the earth. And it is the role of the congregation to say, Amen. Will you join with me in prayer? Father God, I thank you that our opportunity to minister, our opportunity to be involved in reaching people, to be involved in representing you, both within our four walls and also outside of them, Lord. It's not a burden, it's a privilege. We get to do this. And so, Lord, as we engage in a chapter of an amazing letter that talks about how we can do that better, how our church leaders can stand more authentically, Lord, I pray that we receive not my words today, but by yours. Thank you, God. Amen. No worries. So, good morning, everyone. So, throughout this kind of month of July, a few of you may be a little bit switched on and may have sensed the theme of what we're talking about, because we are talking about the pastoral epistles. So, it's letters from Paul to a select few that he'd been training to actually be better leaders and to actually set out a template for what church leadership and church operation should look like. Um, we also know that in throughout July, we've started exploring First Timothy, and we're going to continue to do so for a couple more weeks. But for people who haven't been here for every week, let's recap over the story so far. So in the first week, we had Rick up, and he explored chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, um, and also a prelude into chapter 4, and packed it down into three simple truths. That first of all, what type of letter was it? It was the Mandata Principis. So basically what it is, is that this type of letter that Paul was writing to Timothy is akin to one that a ruler would write to a subordinate and then would be read publicly so that the general public could take in as well. And so we do have this illustration of Jesus as king represented by Paul on his stead, um, reaching out to his, um, essentially his subordinate, Timothy, who would be considered a junior area pastor, um, and then it would be read out in the general public so that we, the church, can also receive and follow instead. Um, we also know that this letter was written with a purpose. It was a letter to remind us what our goal as believers is, that we are to be advancing God's work, his economia theo, or God's economy, which is by faith. And finally, that, and most importantly, we learned that love is not only a feeling, but it's also it, when it becomes a disposition, an attitude, it becomes who we are. And because of this, we know that the only way to advance God's worth, uh, work is to continue to live out our faith through faithful devotion, not just in our actions, but in our attitudes as well, our hearts. Faith and love are the heart of Paul's message. And then in the second week, we had Josh Huggett up, and he was actually talking about chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. 
And as a personal side, I'd like to um, contribute something to his message, which is that when we accept that there is a God, that a God exists, and then secondly, and I'd argue most importantly, we accept that that God is objectively good, that a standard is set, that goodness is not a subjective to each their own sort of perspective anymore, but it's rather an objective mark that you either meet or you don't meet once we accept that there is a standard to be kept. But Josh actually would aptly illustrate that the basis of the law, that God's law, is consistent. Jesus didn't come away to do away with God's old law in the Old Testament, but rather he came to fulfill it. And the validity of the law, that the law is good when it is used properly, means that the law is good when it is taught as God taught it which is the basis of why we see letters like in Timothy, not written by God, but in dedicated uh, followers like Paul, as truth. It's also why we need the law. That Josh used a really great analogy that says that if you compare yourself to your neighbor, that you may actually come off looking pretty good. But can you hold that same standard when you are comparing yourself to God? Paul considered himself to be the worst of the worst with sinners. But he also considered himself equally to be an example to sinners of what we need to be like, that he needed the law. He absolutely needed that law. And so we move on to the third week. Rick was back up again. He was exploring chapter 1, verses 18, um, to chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, And what we essentially took out of this is that much like in life, there are difficult and controversial things to address in first Timothy. Um, But the heart of the letter is very much that we, the church need to move forward in faith and move towards faith and love and away from anything that could separate us and divide us um, in fruitless and painful division. And on top of that, we also took away that we can do this by devoting ourselves to God's plan and God's work pay faithful attention to God's way of ordering things, that focus on the essentials, make sure that you're taking time to read and pray, make sure that you're being an active part of your church congregation and your church community. Um, And also is through these things that God reveals his plan to us, um, through these things that we have an opportunity to join in God's work. Personally, I'd also attribute that there's a Bible verse that most of us know, if anyone's a fan of Colin Buchanan, that the song will be burnt into your mind forever. But James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That that simplifies that standard. And then finally, last week, we also had Rick back up again. Um, and he um, basically was going through chapter 2 verses 11 to 15 and engaged in a hotly contested debate, approaching it from an egalitarian position um, over a complementary position. And he did it to demonstrate why the teachings and instructions in Timothy are actually dedicated to everyone. And to reiterate his conclusions, in the end, the biblical foundations of gender relations are born out of the image of God. That men and women are equal, but different. And it is a very difference that makes men and women valuable at every level of the church. We, needed more, we need more women leaders, pastors, and teachers, even if you can find yourself to roles where women won't have authority over men. If that's your position, I will respect it. Personally, however, I believe that there is a number of um, reasons to be wary of applying these verses universally, as Paul's instructions make good sense within Ephesian culture, and I believe it is within that context that we should guide our applications. And so that brings us to me, that I get the fun fun side of actually following that up. And we're going to be essentially, where does that leave us now? We understand that as we enter into this new topic, that we have three simple things to take away from it. That it is a letter built off God's law. It's a letter to be heard and followed by everyone. And the mandates that are given aren't just moral teachings, but more importantly, they're instructions on how we can actually use this to fulfill the purpose that is set out for us. They're tools to use. And so for those who are familiar with 1 Timothy, you may have an idea of where we are headed next. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, as Amy so generously read out to us, um, it's where Paul begins to identify the qualities and characteristics of church leaders um, and effective le- church leaders and what we should personify. That it's because these teachings um, enter into what effective leadership is, though, that for a lot of people, they naturally expect the sermon to focus on this. And so for the general population who aren't church leaders, 
we can find ourselves falling into a trap where we switch off for a sermon, we take the day off, which is why I'm not going to give that sermon. The sermon I have to give, same as the letter, is to you first. To the general people, same as me. That this letter was for all of us. And so the first part of this message is to you. So, the way that our church has started to delegate roles is actually quite a new practice. It's newer than you'd think. And so while today we can attribute the roles that follow with bishops in Episcopos and deacons in Diakonos, um, that we can typically attribute them to things like elders, uh, the board, senior pastors and overseers, and then in area leaders like youth, kids, all that sort of stuff with deacons, that it is a newer practice than you would think. Um, and so when you actually consider how this would have been applied to the church standards at the time, essentially a lot of house churches interacting and overmingling with each other, maybe having a little bit of a consensus for the region, and then that would become the church of that region, that we can see that these same standards would actually apply to more singular people. Um, and so the thing about, yeah, the thing about when we look through this sort of stuff is, is that with deacons first, Paul has certainly written these instructions in mind with deacons being a specific role in the church. But I would personally attribute that at best, at the absolute widest reaching frame, because of the fact that big tenets of our faith of being priesthood of all believers and also considering that the actual definition of deacon is the one who serves the church. At its widest reaching possibility, one could make the argument that due to the Great Commission, therefore everyone go out and um, go forth to the corners of the earth, that all of us are deacons. But considering that Paul has written more specifically in mind that there is a set role inside the church, at the very least we can say that these are attitudes and tributes that we need to aspire towards because it is a noble task to pursue actual leadership in church and these at the very least are characteristics that we need to undertake in our day-to-day -day life. That the fact that Paul's writings here are the same as elsewhere as well show that the instructions he has for deacons can be taken away from others. And this is consistent with verses in Ephesians, Colossians, and etc. And so we're actually going to undergo looking through what these specific attributes are. So, deacons likewise are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing in, of dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience, and they must first be tested. And then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, women to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's written from the NIV translation, if anyone is really particular about translations. So, we're going to, yeah, for anyone who's heard me preach before, you know that I love to actually go deeper diving into these actual definitions because I feel like it gives us a greater understanding of what's actually being asked of us. So, I do apologize if it is a little bit academic, but I do feel like this is a necessary thing to undergo. So, let's actually have a look through these again. Serious. Normally, people would attribute serious, especially in our English understanding of it, to be quite rigid, quite stoic, maybe a little bit quiet. But in fact, the actual word used for serious is good character, honorable, worthy of respect. The interesting one is when we move on to holding fast to the mystery of the faith. That sounds very poetic, very Christianese, but what it actually does is that the words used for mystery are not so much something that we need to uncover. It's not us initiating a pursuit of uncovering a truth, same as someone might, you know, be a detective and uncover a mystery there. But it's rather the word used for mystery almost entails that God is revealing himself to us. So it's actually God on the, on the assertive there. And so what this would imply is, is that someone who is holding fast to the mystery of the faith must be in good standing with their relationship with God. Because as we know from verses like James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you're actively pursuing your faith with God, he will be leaning close to you. They can't be double-tongued. Don't be hypocritical in words or action. Personally, I would go further and say that we know from the Sermon on the Mount that actions are part of the picture, that the heart behind it is just as equal, that adultery does not start 
with the action. It starts with the lust in your own heart. And so we need to entail that into are we actually living true to our values as Christians? Drunkenness or indulging in much wine. Another, um, another translation for it is drunkenness, and it is also pretty typically applied to the overseers part of this sermon. But in a previous message on this stage, I actually discussed the fruits of the Spirit. Um, and what we looked at was that when Paul was commenting on drunkenness, he spoke out against um, drunkenness because when we saw it went beyond the action itself, drunkenness is its own problem. I will take a second to reset. The notes here are a little bit weird. But... Paul spoke out first and foremost against the action, but then he actually spoke out further against the attitude behind it. In fact, because he has a Hebrew context, not just a Roman one, he uses the Hebrew understanding of drunkenness, which is skir. Um, And it's a word that's often attached to people who become drunk with sorrow. So it means that when we become so consumed by our emotions sometimes, like grief or frustration or suffering, and that's when we think that we will happily relinquish control to nothing that you just give up and you allow yourself to become consumed by that. That, personally, I would attribute that it would also come with an element of being too proud to give that over to God. And so it's the indicative issue is a greater separation with God, which would tie in hand in hand with holding fast on the mysteries of the faith. So, that is a whole lot to take on. If we look over to our next slide, that the standards for a deaconess or the wife of a deacon, is also just as interesting. And as we know from actually discussing into um, our conversations last week, that we can expand on that. Deaconesses, or the wife of a deacon, needs to be serious. Again, we know what that one is, but it is the same standard of a deacon. On top of that, temperate, restrained in all things, not just emotions, the same as a deacon. Faithful in all things, Full of faith in God, not just the typical trustworthiness that we associate with that word. Holding fast to the mysteries of the faith, the same as a deacon. And they're not slanderers. They're not throwing other people under the bus for any reason in word, action, or attitude. Hypocritical, the same as a deacon. Which is why, personally, I would attribute that no matter where you stand on the conversation on that, these are attributes that we can take into our own personal life, regardless of the gender. So, what do we do with all of this? What do I do about this? Well, as we can see, all of these qualities mirror the Sermon on the Mount. That, in theory, all is well and good, but I would certainly like to know what we do with this further than just knowing what the words mean. That because of the Sermon of the Mount, we know that it goes beyond actions, it goes into heart. And with Timothy 13, we know those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance of our faith in Christ. First and foremost, this is taking on and applying it to your own life in a way that's actually beneficial to God. These aren't just moral teachings. These aren't just attitudes to emulate in your own life. But like we alluded to before, these are things that we should be emulating These are things that we should take into our day-to-day lives because they are tools that are used to fulfill the job. That the whole point, the thing that unites us with this letter is that we are all united in our goal to advance God's work, which is by faith. And so these go beyond just learning how to be a better person. These actually go into how do we actually do this? Now, at the very least, you have developed a greater relationship with God by emulating attitudes that are pleasing to him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But additionally on top of that, these are useful tools that you can use to be an example in the same way that Paul was an example before us. The forerunner of our faith with being the worst of sinners but also an example to sinners, we can emulate to others as well who are yet to understand Christ like we do. And now we get to the part of the message that we are expecting, the message for our leaders, the message for our overseers, our bishops, our episcopos, the ones who lead the church. First and foremost, I would encourage you again from James, if you haven't seen the theme here, I really like James, but not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who, yeah, we know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. 
But I do love that Paul encourages us by saying those who pursue this role pursue a noble task. That we do have that little bit of a juxtaposition there that the restricted few who do fit that role should be commended for their pursuit of that role. And to, so to spare that time of actually going into um, going into word for word what each of these expectations are, we'll break that down in a second. But I'd like to add in that at the time that Paul wrote these letters, the standards weren't high for those who should be in leadership positions um, in the churches. And so the qualities that we're going to see mentioned in the verses may at face value not seem terribly exceptional. But I promise you that when we're given a position of power, we have an obligation to be more morally and ethically upstanding than the common man, not less. And because of that, we can see how important integrity is to deacons as our capacity to serve. So let's see how it affects you too. Here's, yeah, here's a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets in his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given over to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He may also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and fall into the devil's trap. And so, like I said, as we go through actually seeing what each of these words mean, we are going to stay a little bit more general because there is a lot more ground to cover. So, what these bishops and overseers are is that they are like a deacon. We see consistent words in there, temperate, faithful to their wife. We see that they're, um, they're faithful to their partner, able to lead their house well, et cetera, et cetera. That deacons, considering, and this would make sense, that if the deacon is the servant of the church, that they do set the minimum standard. And so we expand on that as we go higher and higher into our churches. Again, overseers must be above the call of duty. On top of this, we see that they're above reproach. They're not just spoken of well, but deservedly so. That I do have the word for this. That Paul uses the Greek word ana, yeah, anapolimptos, which is actually not just spoken of well, but deservedly so. That it had been consistent enough in behavior to have earned that, not just demanded by rank. On top of that, they're self controlled. Paul uses the word um, epikis. I can't speak that, but we, it means that we aren't just patient, but patient to an reasonable extremes, to the point that it would not make sense anymore. They remain patient in all things. Managing family. So we have already seen this expected of with deacons, but the parallels between greater spheres of church leadership and smaller uh, spheres of community leadership is actually done again and again in Paul's letters to, um, yeah, to the churches and also to church leaders. So we see it in Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Timothy, Titus, and a couple others. And so a few commentaries typically done by the people who are responsible for a lot of the Bibles in the room, Tyndale, actually do put out a commentary on, um, on 1 Timothy, and they've actually contributed that this passage will also co-align with what Paul even alludes, alludes to himself, that one's management of a family and managing the complexities and difficulties of a marriage, a household, and of children is a great illustration of what managing churches are like as well, as I'm sure that our leaders could probably attest. So, meanwhile, a lot of these characteristics expect that a leader has already had a deep grasp of biblical principles, that they have already got a close relationship with God and have walked with him enough to understand what is expected. Um, so, a close relationship with God, which observes how each of these are... Eight. Let me try that one again. I do apologize. Meanwhile, a lot of these characteristics expect that a leader that has a deep grasp of biblical principles and a close relationship with God and observe how many of these are actual fruits of the Spirit already, or at least tie into them. So, we have things like if we keep going forward. Cool, cool, cool. Not given to drunkenness. We have already gone through with this. I do apologize about that slide. Um, but is not violent but gentle. Gentleness in the fruits of the Spirit. 
Um, we have not quarrelsome, don't relish in being antagonistic, is not a lover of money, you can't serve two masters. It's given an expectation that you already have a deep grasp of Old Testament law and then also the fruits of the Spirit. And in fact, when we go forward even more, we see must manage his family well, as we have discussed. Must not be a recent convert, again, entailing that you actually do have a deep enough relationship with God that you're autonomous. Um, you must have a good reputation with outsiders, which does speak for himself. But I would also like to add that if we are an example to our fellow Christians, if we're emulating Paul and being the worst of sinners, but also an example to others, we can e expand beyond that to be example to those outside our four walls of the church. And finally, even things like able to teach um, not only associates itself with the discourse around women in leadership, but also addresses the fact that a lot of aspiring leaders, unfortunately, typically women at the time of the writing, due to a lower access to scriptural training outside of their husbands, um, did not have in-depth knowledge of the law. However, I would like to rally on that and say that because times are different now, that that the unifying standard in that is, is that if you have a deep grasp of scripture, you should be expected to teach or capable of teaching at the very least. Um, in all these cases, exceptionalism is vital. So what should I do about this? Now we can actually already emulate and expand on the expectations of deacons that I would be encouraging our leaders to consider to themselves. What am I doing? Am I doing this well? Where do I need to grow what do I need to improve on? But as we're leaders, I like to listen to a lot of um, to a lot of leadership podcasts. I was actually fortunate enough to go through a few leadership trainings, and one of the biggest people I like to listen to nowadays is Craig Rochelle, and he put forward a really good standard for leaders, which is that good leaders always bring someone else along with them. That as you grow, as you move on to your next position, you're taking someone to fill your place. Good leaders bring someone with them. And so I would encourage our leaders in the church to continue to reach out to, our, um, to the congregation and encourage them to, at the very least, ask those same questions or encourage them and guide them in, in it yourselves. And additionally, we're responsible for fostering this in those around you and then fostering it in the culture of your church. So what's Ellenbrook doing already? Where can we do better? Where can we start building into and I'd personally like to take an aside to actually appreciate the things that we already do. I've been fortunate enough to serve with you guys for near on a year now, which time goes by quick. But this church is one of the most active social community churches I've seen in a long time. Between Parenting Grove, between Ellenbrook Mills, youth, kids, inside our four walls, but also actively just trying to better our fellow people and engage with already existing groups. We look to partner with other groups. We are active in our Baptist Church WA communities. That we are an active group and it is exceptional, but there's always more that we can do. Father God, I thank you that the weight of ministry is not on our shoulders, but on yours. That we know that with the Holy Spirit through us, that it's not our burden to minister, but it's our opportunity to be willing. That it's your voice that works through us. And thank you that that's just as true for leadership. That while each of our current standing leaders um, and those who have come before and those who will come after bring their own unique capacities to the table, that thank you that it's your direction and their willingness to be receptive and open to your direction that will help our church thrive. Thank you for the courage that they've taken before. Thank you for the attitudes of wisdom that they bring in now and thank you for the future where they will be wise again. Thank you, Lord, for our leaders and we really do just take the opportunity to bless them and recognize them for their work. Amen.